Francisco Bay has long been known as a large deep water seaport. Here you can see through the Golden Gate Bridge to the cities of San Francisco and Oakland in the background. You also see a large container ship making its way out to sea under the Golden Gate Bridge. The goal of navigation is to get safely where you're going without running aground, running into something, or colliding with another ship. Looks pretty easy with a big wide harbor such as San Francisco has, but there are dangers. In 1936, the steamship Ohioan ran aground in heavy fog. This grounding is famous in city lore because many citizens came out to Ocean Beach to look at it, including my granddad who took this picture. Fortunately, no one was killed in this particular mishap, but that was not always the case. Piloting is fundamentally very simple, but to quote from Dutton's Navigation and Piloting, the textbook for my own navigation classes years ago, quote, Piloting requires the greatest experience and the nicest judgment of any form of navigation. Constant vigilance, unfailing mental alertness, and a thorough knowledge of the principles involved are essential. Mistakes in navigation can generally be discovered and corrected in the open sea before the next landfall. In piloting, there's little or no opportunity to correct errors. Even a slight blunder may result in serious disaster, end quote. Uh, like the one you see here, or like the one that happened in the Suez Canal just a few days ago. Hello, and thanks for stopping by. My name is Bruce Castleman. I am a volunteer docent at San Francisco Maritime National Historic Park. I was once the navigator of a U.S. Navy ship, and so nautical charts and piloting were a big part of my life. By piloting, we don't mean airplanes. We mean when a sailor navigates a ship from place to place using visual landmarks such as lighthouses, beacons, buoys, other prominent landmarks, rocks, cliffs, and so on. In general, within sight or radar range of land. How to know where you are in this big bay? It looks like there's lots of open water, and in fact there is. The San Francisco side is well known as a deep water harbor, but the Oakland side gets much silting and requires digging out by dredges to keep the channels from getting too shallow for ships to pass. There are other hazards too. Large ships like the one we just saw use global positioning systems, or GPS, that track via satellite. And much like the one in your smartphone, only more capable and more complex. Before such systems existed, the navigator had to use a paper map instead of an electronic one programmed into some device. Such a specialized map is called a nautical chart. This is the harbor chart for San Francisco Bay. You can see marks all over what was just blue water in the preceding photograph. I'm standing next to a full-size edition of the San Francisco harbor chart, so you can see how large it actually is. It's not something you'll roll up and put in your pocket. You have to tape it down to a table surface and work from there. A quick orientation. North is at the top, so south is at the bottom, east is to the right, and west is to the left. Most nautical charts are oriented that way. San Francisco is at lower left, and Oakland is on the right. On most nautical charts in the United States, land is indicated in yellow. Some countries use gray instead of yellow. Deep water is left white on the paper, and the blue parts mark shallow shoal water. The numbers that appear frequently in the water tell how deep is the water at that point. Nautical charts, and indeed all maps, are graphic representations of physical spaces. They are social products, which means they are meant for use by people. Using coded symbols, some things are put on charts and maps for particular reasons, and other things are deliberately left off for other reasons. The coded symbols are listed in chart number one, a joint publication of the Defense Mapping Agency and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA NOAA. It's available to the public online and in print. Now take a look at this detail from the San Francisco Harbor chart. It shows the area of the Maritime National Historic Park. There are four purple arrows that point at four black dots on a black line. The line marks the seawall built to protect the harbor from waves on the bay, and the arrows point to the light towers that were put on it as navigational aids. One of them is circled in green, 
both on the chart and in the photograph. FLY 2.5S 21 feet 4M identify that particular light's characteristics and the A for alpha is its name. Tower Alpha is 21 feet high and it's topped by a yellow light that flashes every two and a half seconds and has a luminous range of four nautical miles in clear weather. Lighthouses such as Split Rock on Lake Superior and Thomas Point on Chesapeake Bay are accurately charted as aids to piloting. So are prominent buildings that are easily seen from harbors such as Coit Tower in San Francisco. Buoys also appear on charts and can be placed for a number of reasons. Besides marking underwater hazards, they are often placed to mark the limits of a shipping channel. This is red buoy number 14 on the right side of the ship channel going into San Diego, just opposite green buoy number 15 on the other side of the charted channel. In this photograph from Wikimedia, you can see red buoy number 14 with its red light and a radar reflector on top and a happy sea lion perched down on the base. You have to be careful about buoys though. They are anchored to the bottom and have chains, so they rise and fall with the tides, and because of the slack in the chain, they float around the anchored position in what's called a swing circle. You can never count on a buoy being exactly in its charted position the way you can with a landmark navigation aid, but you must still use buoys as visual guides. Although there are none in San Francisco, Many harbors and waterways have specially placed markers called visual ranges. By maneuvering to keep them vertically aligned, you know that you are precisely on the prescribed track. Here's a good image from Wikimedia of a visual range on a Finnish island in the Baltic Sea. If the two red lines and the four white lines were all vertically aligned, then the ship would be exactly on track. You can see that this ship is left of track and needs to steer back to the right to get back on it or more likely the ship was already turned onto the next leg of its transit. Ship is very close to that shore, judging from the windows on that wooden house right behind the lower right range marker. On the left is the 1853 San Francisco Harbor chart and on the right is the 1859 edition. Note that the Coast Survey decided to print the 1859 chart oriented with west at the top instead of the usual north as they had done in 1853. The earlier chart is rotated here so you can more easily compare the two. You can see that before the Civil War, the city of San Francisco only covered today's northeastern part, which is at lower right as seen in both charts here. But look at the differences in just six years. Probably the most noticeable difference is the landfills by Rincon Point, which are circled in green on both charts. The annexation of California, followed by the population influx that accompanied the discovery of gold in the Sierra Nevada, led to a huge influx of shipping into San Francisco Bay. Production of reliable nautical charts of the Pacific Coast became an urgent priority for the Coast Survey and this 1853 chart is one product of that effort. North is at the top, Marin Peninsula is at upper left, San Francisco is in the lower center, and Oakland and Berkeley are on the right. In the upper right corner, there is a smaller scale inset showing the recommended approach to the Golden Gate from the Pacific Ocean. Here's the 1853 chart along with the 2017 edition. They both bear the title Entrance to San Francisco Bay, they look very much the same, which should not be a surprise. You can see circled in green Four Fathom Bank offshore and Alcatraz Island in the bay, right where they've always been. But note how different is the San Francisco City waterfront between the two charts. One thing that is not much different is the recommended approach to the Golden Gate from the Pacific, circled in red on both charts. The overall accuracy of the 1853 chart is another tribute to the work of the Coast and Geodetic Survey, a tradition continued today by its successor, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Take a few more moments to look over these charts and to reflect on both change and continuity over time. Three major bridges stand where none had been before. 
buoys mark a channel west from the Golden Gate Bridge to the open sea. The city of San Francisco has expanded, but is still where it was. But starting where the Golden Gate Bridge is now and going all the way around to the airport, which is off the bottom of the chart to the south, only one spot on the entire shore is the same as it was in 1853. That one is Black's Point between our park and Fort Mason. It's too minute even to mark on this display. Old maps and charts are fun, and they can be good decorations for desk mats, mouse pads, framed and hanged on a bulkhead, or even put onto a coffee mug. One of my personal favorites is this 1919 edition of the Duluth Superior Harbor Chart. That's where I first learned to sail. Duluth, Minnesota, upper left, and Superior, Wisconsin, lower center, are at the western end of Lake Superior in the entire Great Lakes water system. Most of the piers that you see on this chart funnel iron ore and other minerals to Lake Erie and onto steel mills in Pennsylvania and Ohio. But you have thousands of choices to download at no charge from the NOAA Historic Charts website. San Diego, Honolulu, New York, Guam, you name it. Start at their homepage, https colon slash slash historicalcharts dot dot gov slash and go from there. When you're out to sea, beyond visual and radar range of any kind of land, then what? There are no more lighthouses and buoys to guide you. You can see the sun, stars, planet, and the moon, but you must use different navigation techniques. Next time we will talk about navigation on the high seas. All of us at San Francisco Maritime National Historic Park look forward to the day that we can meet in person. Until then, each of us wishes each of you fair winds and following seas. Be safe.